Well, how's everybody doing? We doing okay? Man, it's good to be here and to be able to open the series. Welcome to everybody in the room, everybody watching online. I hope you join in with me, join in the chat. Let me know you're listening. Man, I'm so excited to launch this brand new series. Somebody say new. Oh, it's a new series. It's kicking off today and I love it. It says, think again. And the subtitle is this, it's all in your head. It's all in your head. Well, there are a lot of ways that we can begin a series on the mind, but I want to open up this, open up with this question. Have you ever thought you were experiencing something and found out that it was actually just all in your head. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Maybe you thought you heard something, right? But, but nobody else heard it. It's maybe like the beginning of a scary movie or something like, wait, did you hear that? No, nobody else. It's like you thought you heard it, but, but you found out that it was just in your head or, or perhaps you thought you had done something, right? I, I swear I did that thing, right? But, but, but nobody else can see that you did it because you didn't. It was all in your head. Spouses love to remind us of this, right? Is it? Yeah, I, th- I thought I did it. Well, you didn't, okay? So we thought we did it, but, but it was all in our head. Or, or perhaps maybe you thought you left something somewhere, but you just can't find it. Has anybody ever done that before? I, I swear I left it right there, and it's, it's not there anymore because it was just in your head. You see, our thoughts can be tricky, can't they? Our thoughts can deceive us and and they can lead us to believe even what isn't true. Rebecca and I were on vacation uh, just a few months ago and we were staying at this beautiful hotel. It was on the 20th floor and it was this great view. And I don't know about you, but when I'm on vacation, I like to sleep in. Anybody else with me in the room? Okay, how about online? And we, we like to sleep in on vacation. There's just something about when there's a number on the door, I can sleep longer. There's nothing to do. There's no schedule, right? And, and so we're looking forward on our second day of vacation to be able to sleep in at this hotel until we started hearing this alarm at 7 a.m. 7 a.m., this thing, this fire alarm starts going off. Now, if you're like me, you, you hear a fire alarm and all you're doing is thinking, this is a false alarm, right? I just give it a minute, it'll turn off. And we waited for a minute or two minutes and five minutes, and this thing's still going off. And Let me remind you, we're on the 20th floor, okay? It's not like there's this easy escape plan, right? So so all of a sudden, as it kept going off, we were like, okay, maybe we should pack up some things. We start packing up some things. And the alarm is still going off over and over again. And so now I'm getting nervous, okay? Uh, I'm getting nervous. I I start thinking to myself, is is the building shaking right now? Like I just, I started thinking, oh my goodness, something's, this this is not good, this is wrong. So now we're taking this seriously, right? Now we're like packing up our stuff. We start running down the stairs and we meet a lot of people that are also trying to rush down the stairs. We we saw this lady, she was from another country. I couldn't understand what she was saying, but, but she was screaming and crying on the phone, talking to a loved one. I'm like, oh my goodness, like this is bad. This is bad news, right? And so we keep rushing down and and finally we get to like the 10th floor and and I start feeling heat coming from from one of the hallways. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I told Rebecca, I'm like, I think think this is where the fire is. It's like, it's coming from this floor. We gotta hurry. And we're, we're starting to get emotional and run down these steps until we hit the ground floor when we see a bunch of firefighters seemingly not caring about this fire, right? And, and I'm like, wait a second, they're, they're chill and I'm freaking out. There's a problem here, right? Either they're wrong or I'm wrong and I'm pretty sure I'm wrong. And I, we overheard the firefighter tell somebody, hey, everything's okay. It was just a false alarm. Now, why do I tell you all this? And I, for anybody that's heard any amount of preaching, you can probably assume where I'm going with this, but... When the demeanor and the voice of authority declared what was true, it didn't matter what I thought. It didn't matter what my mind depicted to be true. My responsibility in that moment where I saw their demeanor and I heard their voice, my responsibility was to align my thoughts with the truth. And that's exactly what God's calling us to do. That's what this series is all about. It's about thinking Again, perhaps your thoughts were going in one direction, perhaps an anti-Bible, anti-God direction, and he's calling us to think 
again. He wants us to think uh, like, like he thinks so that we can live in a way that he wants us to live. Isaiah 55, 9 tells us this, that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Oh, the way he thinks and the way he understands is at a level that's beyond us. We couldn't possibly understand the complexities and the vastness of his thoughts. And yet we live in a world that's constantly trying to outthink God. Oh, we have our scientists and our philosophers and we have our thought leaders or sometimes we call them thinkers, right? What I want to know is, is that really a job? Like a thinker? Like, what do they do all day? Do they just think and they get paid for that? Like, that sounds like a great job, okay? But, but, but we have all these people, right? And they're doing everything they can to explain the universe, to explain the meaning of life. But my question for them is, who do they think they are, right? Who do we think we are to believe any human being's thoughts can outweigh the thoughts of God? I don't know about you, but there hasn't been one day in my life that I could fully trust my own thoughts. Mark chapter seven, verse one speaks to this when it says that out of a person's heart comes evil thoughts. Evil thoughts. Uh, as humans, that, that's what comes from us. It comes from our inner being. So who am I as an imperfect human to trust what I think over what God says? Yet so often, this is exactly what we do. And as we look around our world, it's what our culture do, is doing as well. We put more weight, and we do this as believers too, we put more weight into what we think about what God says instead of what God actually says. And I'm here to challenge us today that it's time to think again. It's time to rethink. It's time to align our thoughts with the truth of God's word. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, Paul gives us a teaching, and I, I think that we're going to spend the most of our time, the majority of our time here today, but but 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, starting in verse 1, it says, By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you. Now, when I first read that, I was a little bit like, that's not Paul. Like, the Paul I read is not timid. You know, he's not shy. Right? But, but if you look at it in context, what he's speaking to is he doesn't have to yell as much or talk as much when he's with the people because they're behaving. And then when he leaves, it's almost like the people start listening to the world and start listening to the culture and listening to secular society. And it comes into the church and he's like, please don't do that. And look what he goes on to say, but bold towards you when I'm away, when I'm away I, I beg you, this is what he says, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of the world. We shouldn't be living by those standards because in verse three, for we live in a world where we do not wage war like the world does. We do things differently, right? The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world, but on the contrary, what does it say? They have divine power to demolish strongholds. Oh, this is some significant power. The Holy Spirit that is, in, that is within us, the battle of the mind that is within us. We have the power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And what does it say? We take captive. How many thoughts? Every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Today's topic, if I would sum it up, it would be like this, is unthreading the threats to your thoughts. Unthreading the threats to your thoughts. Can we pray? Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to look at the truth of your word. God, there are so many lies in this world. There's so much deception. There are so many voices trying to say so many things. But God, today we turn our ears toward one voice and we ask God that your thoughts would, would come together and align with ours today as we make every thought captive in obedience to Christ. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said nice and loud. Amen. 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 I heard that one over there real loud. Thank you very much. Well, I admittedly don't know much about sewing, but, but I do know this. If the theology of many Christians today in 2022 were a quilt, they would be threaded 
by enemy influence. I know this because 2 Corinthians 11, 3, you can see it on the screen there. Just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds, my mind, may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Just like Eve, the enemy loves to sow threatening threads within our minds that pull us away from God's best for our lives. One of the threads that he sows is the thread of doubt. Has anybody experienced this before? The enemy's lies, his doubt. In Genesis 3 verse 1, he created this opportunity for Eve to doubt God's trustworthiness. And he just did it with one little question. It was just a small question. He said, did God really say? Did God really say? Oh, he asks us those kind of questions, but maybe he words it differently for you. He might say, did God really say not to do that? Did God really say not to say that? Did God really say not to see that or be that? And we begin to question God's word as, the, as these doubts begin to be sewn into the fabric of our being. Uh, another thread that he uses is the thread of deception. The thread of deception. Genesis 3.3, 3, try, uh, Eve tries to respond with the truth. She actually tries to tell the enemy the truth of what God said to her. But the enemy refutes her in verse 4 by saying this, you will not surely die. <laughs> You're not going to die. Oh, that's so, that's so above. That's, that's a little extreme. God wouldn't do that. We might hear it differently. We might hear it like this. That sin won't really affect you. Oh, no, it's not going to affect others. It's not going to affect your family. Don't even worry about it. Not a big deal. Maybe you've heard it this way. God will just forgive you. And look, there's some truth to that. There is truth to that. He will. But oftentimes that, times that, that deception pulls us into places we ought not to be. He also uses threads of discontentment. In Genesis 3, 5, the devil reinforces Eve's attention or re refocuses rather Eve's attention on what she's missing. He says, for God knows that your eyes will be opened. The enemy might say it to you different. He might say, look at what you're missing. Oh, look at, look at the fun others are having in comparison to you. Your life doesn't look that good and you're a Christian. Look at all your unsaved coworkers. They're succeeding, they're flourishing. Look at the fun they're having at that vacation. Maybe he says something like, God is keeping you from what you deserve. Oh, this disconcertment. He sows threads of thoughts that threaten your relationship with God. Genesis 3, 6 says it this way as this portion of the story closes out. It says, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. Guys in the room, we need to hear this. It wasn't all Eve's fault. He was right there. Now, listen, I don't know what was going through Adam's mind. I don't know if this was like a happy wife, happy life moment. Like, well, I might as well just eat it. I don't want to hear about it later. I don't, I don't know if it was one of those things. But in all seriousness, we, we see that Eve justifies this moment. And we can see her speaking to it as she says, it's good for food. I mean, it, it's going to be good. We got to eat, right? You know, like. We got to eat. I mean, here's food. I mean, might as well, right? She justifies. Another thing she says is it looks pretty good, right? It, it, it's better than the other ones. We have all this other food, I know, but, but this one looks especially good. We should, we should probably eat it, right? But then there was this third thing that she says where I want to focus our attention today. And it's important because she points out that she wants to desire wisdom, in other words, from the context of which she's speaking, she wants an enhanced thought level from what she has now. She wanted to think at a God-like level. Now listen to me, she's not talking about the mind of Christ that you and I have probably heard so many things about. The mind of Christ is a mindset of humility. It's a mindset of servanthood. That's not what we're talking about here, no. She wants to have the knowledge of God so that her thoughts might equal God's thoughts. And if we're honest with ourselves, many of us have that same problem today. We put our thoughts before God's thoughts. We put our ways before his ways. We want to choose to be our own God. Not all the time, 
not for the big stuff, just for certain situations, right? We want it our way. And here we are thinking ourselves into things we should never be doing because our thoughts threaded with these threats are leading us astray into our own desires. This is why Paul teaches in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, three through four, as we continue on in our passage, it says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they, speaking of the weapons that we do fight with, have divine power to demolish strongholds. For anybody that was here last week, we heard Pastor Daniel talk about this, how we use the word of God to fight for us. The sword, this, this double-edged sword that goes to battle for us. It battles for us in our minds because the battles that this is talking about, it doesn't take place like it does in the world. It happens in our minds because the birthplace of every stronghold is a manipulated thought. I'm going to say that again. The birthplace of every stronghold is a manipulated thought. You may recall in Ephesians, in our Ephesians series that we concluded last week, there was something similar that was said in Ephesians 4, 27. It says, do not give the devil a foothold. Or we explained it as an opportunity. Don't give the enemy an opportunity. Don't give him that entry point into your life. Maybe it be a lie or, or a habit or a negative or impure thought that grows into a stronghold. We need to understand how this works. Footholds become strongholds that enslave us over time. That's how it works. It's one step that leads us to our demise. So what are we supposed to do? <laughs> like, that's all bad news. What, what's the good news? Well, we have to start at least by identifying where our thoughts come from and why they remain threaded in our mind. Where do our thoughts come from and why do they remain threaded in our mind? In a, recent 20, in a recent study in 2020, it estimated that the average person has about 6,000 thoughts every single day. 6,000. It's a lot of thinking. Some of those thoughts are good thoughts, pleasing, good pleasing thoughts that we're going to be talking about in, as we get into this series in the next couple of weeks. Some of these are neutral thoughts. Guys, we love to have a lot of these thoughts, just kind of like thoughts. Don't really matter, good or bad. They're just there, right? But, but let's talk about today... Where do the bad thoughts come from? Why are those bad thoughts there? Now, there's a lot of, there are a lot of reasons for that, but I want to emphasize two specific situations. One of them is this. Our thought patterns are formed through consumption. What are you consuming? How many would agree that we consume a lot of content in our world today? Anybody? Dare I say that most people consume so much content, they can barely think for themselves, right? Everything they think is just someone else's thought. The average American adult watches TV or videos online about five to six hours a day. Statistics show us that the average millennial is on their phone up to four hours a day. I would venture to say that's not even right. It's probably more. Barna's research on millennials found that they spend almost 2,800 hours a year consuming digital content. That's a lot of hours. But this is what makes it heartbreaking. Only about 153 hours of that is Christ-based content. Out of 2,800 hours of content, they suggest only 153 of those hours are Christ-based. The, the rest is YouTube, Instagram, Netflix, you name it. The first president of Facebook, Sean Parker, was interviewed about the effects of social media, and he says this, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. The thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them, was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. How do we consume your time and your attention? Now, look, you might be sitting here thinking, man, I don't know what all this is about. I'm not suggesting we all delete our social media accounts and bring our iPhones to the altar. That's not what I'm saying today. Okay. I don't think we'd have many takers. I don't even think I'd come, but, uh, 
But I am saying this, I'm saying that we have to be careful of the kind of content that's being threaded into the fabric of our thoughts because that content can lead to strongholds, strongholds. What kind of strongholds you might ask? Well, let me tell you, how about fear and anxiety? It doesn't take but listening to the news for about five minutes to be a little anxious, right? I mean, and we're watching it all the time. Fear and anxiety is sown through, those, through that content. What about envy or greed? People looking at different people's accounts and seeing what they're doing, and how successful they are and what vacations they're going on. How does that not somehow make us envious or greedy? Let's talk about lust and addiction. It may start with a TV show that just has a little stuff in it. Not a big deal. Can I tell you, I'm surprised at how many Christians are so open about shows that they watch that I don't know if you've heard, there's a lot of bad stuff in it. Yeah, we talk about it like it's no big deal. And it's that content and it's perhaps even that music, perhaps whatever it may be that leads to other addictions, maybe pornography or other things that are strongholds that the enemy loves to hold you down. What's the content we're consuming? How about laziness and sloth? as I see and know many that will sit there and mindlessly scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. Oh, you're late to everything, but you're just scrolling and scrolling. You're not doing anything with your life, but you're just scrolling and scrolling. I'm not saying this is everybody, but man, there are a lot of people that are just scrolling and scrolling through life. And the Bible has something to say to you. It maybe has something to say to us in 1 Peter 5, 8. It tells us to be alert and of sober mind. Be alert and of sober mind because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, looking for someone to bestow strongholds upon. And he uses the content we consume to thread thoughts that threaten our relationship with God and our connection to him. Our author put it this way. That's the profound truth. You are what your mind looks at. And you are what you contemplate. You are what your mind looks at. You are what you contemplate. So in other words, we have to be careful of what we consume and what we contemplate. Because what we give our attention to will shape the people we become. Amen? We all still with me? We're still here? Awesome. Number two, the second way the enemy uses is this. Our thought patterns are formed through experiences. Through experiences. Now, this can be true of good experiences as well, so we have that, but, but when it comes to bad experiences, the enemy loves to use trauma to twist our thoughts. Oh, he loves to use our trauma, the dark seasons, the valleys of the shadow of death, to draw trauma and, and darkness out of us. In his book, Deeper Walk, Marcus Warner explains how pain points in our lives can cause us to be deceived into believing harmful things about God, about ourselves, and about others. Warner explains how harmful steps, uh, explains the harmful steps that people take when they go through these things. And he starts by talking about the wound, the wound. The wound is this, the wound is when painful experiences occur in our lives. Has anybody ever been through a painful experience? Put your hand on me, does anybody else, man? We've been through some painful experiences. Many of you know, especially through extreme loss, that they leave a hole in our soul that only God has the ability to fill. Nothing else and nobody else can fill that. Only God can do that. But when we don't allow God to fill that hole, we as humans can easily allow our thoughts to predict and project our next steps. So from our wounds, sometimes we allow ourselves to listen to what he says next, our lies. We've been wounded, we've been hurt, we've gone through something painful, and now we begin to hear the lies. We begin to think thoughts like, has God abandoned me? Where is God now? Maybe we ask questions like this, does God even love me? Look at what I'm going through. 
We believe to think thoughts like, it must, he must be punishing me for the sins of my past. He must be punishing me for the things that I've done. And all these thoughts are not God thoughts. They're not from God's word. These are thoughts that the enemy is injecting into our minds to pull us from God's truth. The truth of God's word begins to become polluted by the bad experience because of the lies that we begin to believe in the process. So we experience the wound. We begin to hear and think lies. And then we begin to think and maybe even say what he calls our vows. We then start operating in those lies and we make concrete declarations about the future. Perhaps you or someone you know has said this, I will never trust anyone ever again. After that experience, never again. They've experienced the wound. They believe the lie. And now they move into this vow, this declaration of how they will live the rest of, the, of their life. Perhaps they say things like, God always lets me down. Because they've experienced a wound. They believe the lie. And now they're living in a vow. I've heard people say, I'm done with God. I'm done with church. Never again. Because they've been wounded. They've heard lies. And they're choosing to live in those lies. Listen to me today. You may not even totally mean what you're thinking, but those thoughts add up. They create steps and they move you into places in what, what Walker calls strongholds, which parallels with our passage today. The lies become vows that become strongholds. Eventually, the seeds being planted by those lies and those vows become fruit. And I'm not talking about the good kind of fruit, the, the fruit of the spirit. Rather, it's, it's, it's a bitter fruit that begins to come out. Bitter fruit like bitterness, perhaps fruit like anger or addiction, maybe fear or depression, anxiety or, or even shame. The various cycles that keep people close to their pain, drowning in their sorrow. And the enemy loves when it's just on repeat, 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 repeat. That's when years and years go by and that person is still so close to that pain because they've believed the lie, they've committed the vows, and now they're living in a stronghold. In our world today, we talk a lot about mental health. We talk a lot about mindfulness and various things. And, and there are a lot of these things that are produced that help fix the fruit, right? The anger, the addiction, the anxiety. Oh, we have a fix for that. It's mindfulness. It's this, these certain processes. There's these certain steps. And, and I don't know if you remember, but we heard earlier, we have a divine power to abolish strongholds. We have that power. He, the Holy Spirit that lives within us, has that power. But he does more than that. God does more than fix the fruit. He heals the root. He heals the root. The root of the pain and the emptiness within our heart. And as he heals that root, he begins to teach us how we can bring our thoughts back into alignment with his thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, as we continue in our passage, it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I'm going to ask us to leave that up there for just a moment because I want us to see in context from the Greek, arguments is translated as thoughts or patterns. Pretension is translated from exalted things. So if you see it from the, the Greek translation, what it's saying is we demolish thoughts. We demolish thought patterns that exalt themselves above what God is saying and what God is thinking. And this is accomplished by simply aligning our minds in accordance with the word of God, putting our thoughts next to God's thoughts and seeing if they are the same. Because even when it goes against my will, or even when it goes against my desires or it goes against my way, I have to take those thoughts captive and I have to force them into obedience. We have to take it. We have the power of the Holy Spirit within us to do it. We must take them and make them obedient to the word of God. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's what God is calling us to do. John Stott said it this way. He says, we must allow the word of God to confront us 
to disturb our security, to undermine our, our complacency, and to overthrow our patterns of thought and behavior. So how do we do that? Well, the scripture says, take every thought captive and make it obedient. And you might say, well, well that's great. How do I do that? I think it begins by taking time to think about our thoughts. We have to pause and think about our thoughts. We have to allow the word of God and the voice of God to tell you what the truth is. And there are a lot of practical ways we can do this. I mean, we can get in the word, right? We can, we can pray, we hear about these things, but, but I wanna challenge you to journal. When you write your, th your thoughts down on paper, put your thoughts next to God's thoughts and begin to help make them align. There's another great tool that I've been using recently. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. It's, it's called the One Minute Pause app. That's literally what it's called. You can look it up. It's One Minute Pause app. And it's, it's an application created by John Eldridge. He's a best-selling author. Wild at Heart is one of his books. Many great books that he's written, but... But this app that he's created allows you to not just focus in on God for one minute, but there's a three minute, a five minute, a 10 minute option. And it, it speaks God's word. It speaks these prayers. It guides you in a way to think about your thoughts. It allows you a moment to pause and contemplate what you're thinking and assuring that it aligns with what God is thinking about you. I think many of us in the room are looking for a firefighter to tell us the truth. Maybe in your life, you feel like your world is shaking a little bit. You feel things screaming and going away around you. you. You feel the heat of the fire on that floor like I did just a few months ago. But in your life, you're looking for someone to tell you the truth. And can I tell you, God's word speaks the truth. For you, maybe he's not telling you what my fireman said and that was, everything's okay. Perhaps maybe he's saying to you, get up. <laughs> the alarm is going off. For you, maybe it's the reverse of my story. For you, maybe you're sleeping and there are alarms going off and he's trying to shake you and tell you that there's more, there is better for you. <laughs> and to change your thoughts to align with what God is saying to you. Romans chapter 12, verse two, many of us have known it, heard it. If you've been in church long enough, you know it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but rather what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, of your mind. Why be renewed in your mind? Because of the pulling down of strongholds because of the unthreading to the threats of your thoughts, helping us to make them obedient to Christ. Can we bow our heads across the room today, watching online, everybody under the sound of my voice. I want us just to take a moment and I want us to think again. Maybe you've been thinking in a particular direction, but today God is calling you to think again. For the next couple of moments, allow the Holy Spirit to tell you the truth. Maybe you're here today and you need to demolish any and every thought that doesn't, that doesn't exalt Christ. We need to take it captive and make it obedient to Christ. Would you do it maybe even right now in this moment? For those who may have gone through painful experiences, allow him to heal your heart and fill that place in your soul that only God can fill. Take this moment and think about your thoughts. Allow them to come into alignment with who God is and what he has for you. Help us, Jesus, even in this moment. Just take the next 10 seconds, would you do that? Oh God, Look at our thoughts today. 
Help us to align our thoughts with what the truth of your word says. God, for those in this room that may have misconstrued or turned from you, God, I pray that in this moment they would turn back. As a matter of fact, this is a great moment even right now. Maybe you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus or perhaps you did a long time ago, but it, oh man, you just know that your heart needs to come back to him in this moment. I wanna challenge you to say this prayer. It's a simple prayer. I'm not saying it's an easy prayer. It's a hard one because it costs everything, but it is a simple prayer. And it just says this, Jesus, I'm yours. Jesus, I'm yours. So if you're here today and you know that your heart is not right, you know that your soul is not in the proper place, that your eternity is not secure in Him, I'm gonna challenge you. I'm not gonna ask you to stand or come forward. I just wanna challenge you in this moment to just say this prayer, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm yours, Jesus. The Bible says that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we shall be saved. Oh, when we call upon the name of the Lord, He saves us. And today in this moment, if you've said that prayer, He's saved you. Come on across this room, if that's you, just say it again. Jesus, I'm yours. Jesus, I'm yours. If that was you today and you said that prayer, I just want to say a, a quick prayer over you before I leave today. If that's you and, and, and you said that prayer, you meant that prayer from the bottom of your heart, would you just lift up your hand so I know who I'm praying for all across this room? I see that hand in the back. I see it in the middle, over here to the side. Thank you so much. If you're watching online, make sure you click, let them know, hey, I, I'm, I, that was me. I made that decision. Lift your hand even where you are. Oh, I see those hands across the room. You can go ahead and put them down. Thank you so much. Let's pray before we close today. Father, we thank you that you are a good God. Lord, that you love your people. God, I thank you that you made a way where there was no way. God, just as we talked about as we were taking communion, Lord God, that, that, that through your blood, Lord God, we have salvation. It washes us, makes us white as snow. So God, I thank you for every person in this room, every person that was watching online. God, the, anyone that said yes to you, Lord, I thank you that they are now safe. They are now saved. Their eternity is secure in you. And God, as believers today, I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice that heard this talk, that heard this message, oh God, would begin from this day forward to take their thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ from this day forward for the rest of their lives. And it's in Jesus' matchless name we pray. And everybody shout nice and loud. Say amen. Say amen. Come on, give God praise.